I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversations. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. Reducing caregiver stress, enhancing quality of life, restoring the dignity and independence for our older adults, decreasing stress and frustration, and reducing those out-of-pocket health care costs that can be so detrimental for caregivers. My interview today is with Matt Golden, CEO and co-founder of Map Habit. Map Habit is an interactive care management platform. It combines technology and the science of habits to transform care improve cognition, and reinforce routine habits, all while using smart devices. Matt is passionate about creating tools to support caregivers and providing dementia education. We talk about what systems we can put in place to support caregivers, what research is happening and the science behind the value of those visual cues and maintaining habits. We talk about the National Institute on Health, how their funding has really helped build the credibility of MAP Habit and support their rapid growth. We look at the need for outside support when you're caring for your loved one, the benefits that can happen when we implement those habit-forming routines, and how important the dementia education and engagement is in our life, and how we're supported all on a single platform. Map Habit is supported by an extensive team. I have a lot of respect. I admire the work that Matt's doing, and I cannot wait to see what they come up with next. Here is my interview with Matt Golden. Hi, Matt. This conversation has been a long time coming. We've been connected for a little bit and so happy we finally get a chance to have this conversation about Map Habit and your background and what brought you to this place of sharing this technology with all of us. Yeah, no, I've been looking forward to it as well. And thanks for being so engaging on uh, on social media. And also, you seem like a just phenomenal person with a, with a wonderful heart. So I'm really excited to, uh, to chat with you today. Thank you. Uh, my background really is, it's very different than what I'm doing now uh, with Map Habit. So I really spent the first 20 years of 17, 18 years of my career in corporate America uh, as a management consultant, uh, building out different kinds of strategy and technology solutions for Fortune 100 companies. It was uh, a great learning experience. I got a lot of opportunities to to learn professionally, mentor others, really manage uh, large, complicated uh, multinational software implementations. But at the end of the day, I just wasn't loving what I was doing. And uh, when I was waking up in the morning, it just wasn't exciting and uh, it, not as fulfilling as what I really wanted at the, at the you know, my point in my life that I was at. So uh, right around 2017, I started thinking about what's next. I started talking with actually uh, one of my neighbors. Uh, his name is uh, Stuart Zola. He's a neuroscientist. He actually lived uh, two doors up for me on my cul-de-sac. And uh, we really hadn't talked very much since you know we had lived there for a number of years together. But one day we just started talking and uh, I learned about some of his background as a, as a brain scientist and just understanding how you know memory changes over time and the different kinds of memory systems people have. And that really kind of struck me because I had multiple family members in my life who had different forms of dementia. Uh, One of them, my grandma had Lewy body dementia, who I really didn't get to know very well. Uh, She passed away when I was about six years old and I wasn't really able to to see her too much just because of the nature of that specific form of dementia, which has a lot of hallucinations and a lot of unpredictability. But really, it was my my uncle who was a huge mentor in my life. Uh, he got me my first computer when I was about 10 years old, I think, and um, really, you know, springboarded a, a career on entrepreneurship and, and teaching older adults on how to utilize technology. And it was really that experience, uh, really seeing him change over time and and when he got the diagnosis in his you know really early 60s 
uh, I started seeing, you know, different changes that uh, he was not able to calculate the tip on a bill to not being able to really control his reactions when we're, you know, interacting with people to really gradually starting to lose his independence at home, just completing everyday tasks like, you know, getting dressed or, you know, making coffee or operating the remote control. And, and I witnessed firsthand how much of a toll that took on, on his family and, and indirectly me too. Uh, so it was really kind of those combinations of, of prior experiences with dementia and, you know, talking with Dr. Zola and being at that point in my career where I was looking for something a little more fulfilling. That's really what, uh, what, helped us start Map Habit. It's that marriage of your tech background and professional experience with your family history, meeting your neighbor. It's like fate said, ah, oh, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> this is what's going to happen. And it just speaks to when we're really personally connected to a mission that can really drive us to do big things. Yeah, absolutely. I think whenever you have passion that comes from a, a personal experience and and can kind of see the the things that maybe didn't go your way and and you know areas that could have been improved with really simple practical types of improvements mm -hmm. that's really what gives you the uh you know the fire that burns with inside mm -hmm. me to to really help others to avoid that kind of situation or at least just make their lives uh, just a little bit better mm -hmm. and that's really what we're we're all about we will get into a lot of the nitty gritty so to speak of how map habit works but for the start of our conversation, can you share with us what it is? What's like that overarching description of Map Habit? Well, Map Habit is a, a care management platform for both family caregivers and professional caregivers to really give uh, better individualized support for the people that they're uh, really interacting with on a daily basis. Uh, so that can be anywhere from providing dementia education to caregivers in a senior living facility to a family caregiver that really doesn't have uh, the formal training or they're thrown into a you know, diagnosis of, you know, Lewy body dementia or Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, but on a practical basis, what do you actually do to, you know, extend the independence of your loved one and, and also provide yourself with relief? Mm -hmm. So we do that in the form of education. We have different kinds of cognitive engagement, mental acuity games and, you know, different mindfulness and, uh, and stretching to really help improve balance and uh, really just to help with hand and eye coordination and, uh, and different types of, you know, sensory needs to, to help people stay, uh, you know, really active throughout the day, both physically and mentally. Uh, and then really what we are most known for is the, uh, the, the, the map habit system, which is for step-by-step -step mapping out people's routines. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what drove me in the first place is my uncle taking that example I spoke about earlier with not being able to really operate the remote control. There's three or four different steps that you would need to do. And, uh, you know, you basically locate the remote control and, and, and hit the on button and know what are your favorite channels and, and really kind of break it down into uh, what um, what you would need to do to, uh, to, to complete that task. So that can go for anything from making coffee or, uh, or dressing. So mm -hmm. those three components all together, the education, the cognitive engagement, and the mapping out uh, visually your, your daily routines is, is what Map Habit is all about. So you have thought of the many ways to reach and communicate to people. And when we look at that, we see there's really three overarching uh, categories with Map Habit. It is that care management platform, the education piece, and the engagement. Let's go through, okay, that care management piece. What does that look like when you're incorporating that in various settings? Great question. So let's look at the senior living example. 
we connect with point click care an electronic medical record software to basically import all of the the residents and and care staff that are on the the system so if let's say we're implementing map habit in a memory care setting we'll bring in the the residents and we will uh, go through a a process of uh, of understanding the care plans for them and identifying what are the opportunities for basically building out some of these these visual uh, routines or visual schedules for residents to follow or for caregivers to know the preference. So for example, if someone just loves to have tea at 1 p.m. every day, and just because of the turnover that that happens, that, that message does not get received in that daily shift change meeting, then you can utilize our platform to understand each person's preferences doesn't have to be their whole day. It could just be, you know, one or two things that just make that person happy. Mm-hmm. So uh, that is that is a great way of, uh, of utilizing it uh, just strictly from a care management perspective in senior living. And it can offer like a reminder, right? Hey, Mr. Johnson, you've got tea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Without having them to prompt and, 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 and ask or, so nice. you know, if family members visiting. Um, and you want to get that on, on on the schedule. That's something that you can uh, you can also easily have as well. So nice. And then for for care management in the home, it's really useful for if you have a home care aide coming in or another family member because you need to let your mom have a break. Uh, you can basically have all of the preferences of the individual already stored in there, the, the sequence and the way that they like to do things, uh, the uh, types of games that they like playing, the time that they do their their afternoon walk, and, and really have that in a step-by-step manner mm-hmm. so that when you, you know, go to make a meal for someone, for example, you you make it with the right, you know, seasonings and you don't overburn something and, and, and know that the um, it only has to be on for five minutes instead of 10 minutes because their microwave is like super high powered for whatever reason. So it's it's great for kind of mapping out daily daily routines in the home so that someone who is maybe on the early stage can use it as a compensatory tool to follow on their own, but also for a caregiver so that they can leave and, and feel comfortable with someone coming in and, and have everything listed on there. It's great for medication adherence, for example, because a lot of times at home, um, you don't have a, a nurse or nurse practitioner come in to to provide the uh, the list of information. And it's, it's, it's a big uh, cost. Uh, for our health system to uh, to miss your your medication or take too little or even take too much. So being able to to have that as as kind of that daily reminder is uh, has been really useful for some of our clients. That's a huge asset. That's one thing that families have to go into the home quite a bit and support their loved one on is calling mom at 10 a.m. Mom, did you take uh, your blood pressure medication or is it full? And so being able to have that extra level of support is vital for people that that need that. Yeah, and it's all visible. So Mm -hmm. especially when you have someone come in and maybe you're at work and you don't know what they're doing, you once they complete that task, it marks it as complete and you can get notified or you can more passively go in after the fact and see if it was done. So mm-hmm. it really does help with peace of mind and compliance. And it's a great you know, differentiator for, for home care companies too, to, to have that where it's useful for care staff, um, but also very useful for family members, whether they're there or even afterward. Yeah, the checks and balance. The education piece, you also have a really great team that helps support that education. If you'd want to speak to that, uh, I think there's a lot of value in that. Sure. Yeah. Let's let's talk to this senior living uh, aspect. Uh, so our, our lead dementia educator is uh, Lynn Possell. Uh, she's had over 17 years as a uh, dementia educator, and uh, she has really developed this uh, unique curriculum um, that is very individualized and really teaches uh, care partners to be critical thinkers and, and thoughtful observers. Uh, and she has basically a whole wellness review and uh, a facilitator guide to uh, to help train um, caregivers on, on, you know, the best practices for, you know, PTSD, for sundowning, for hand and eating support, uh, really all the 
all the areas that uh, we need to to understand people's uh, preferences and as things change, uh, what to do. So uh, we we basically, after the initial, you know, looking at the care plans in Point Click Care, for example, and bring it into Map Habit, uh, we will have uh, weekly touch-ins with uh, with with the care teams um, at a specific time, and um, you know they'll they'll tell tell us how things are going, and we'll we'll give them advice, and maybe there's a new map that can help them out with uh, a specific ADL, or um, there might be something that was learned from another community within the portfolio that can be really useful. And um, really, the goal is uh, to get people more more self sufficient and, and really give better quality and individualized care. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of in the inpatient or in, in the senior living space. But really the example I gave earlier with family caregivers being thrown into a diagnosis and really not knowing what to do, we really do walk them through that that full, you know, 30, 40 minute uh, assessment. What are their needs, their abilities, what works on the environment, what's the flow of the day, and uh, and really helps them build a care plan from scratch when they may not even have that as a resource. So uh, it can be really useful in, in both of those environments. That's such a big help. I just had a conversation the other day with a woman who was, to- you know, told that her father had a diagnosis and then they left the doctor's office and that was it. There, there wasn't any uh, further explanation of now here's what to do and here's how we can set you up for success. And I know that that's just one small example, but it just speaks to the need for that extra level of outside support. Yes. Yeah. There, there's so many phenomenal organizations mm-hmm. out there like the Alzheimer's Association, the Lewy Body Dementia Association here in Atlanta, the Atlanta Regional Commission, and a lot of these area agencies on aging that that do help um, families in addition to, for example, Aging Life Care Association with the geriatric care managers. So if you know about all those resources and can, you know, uh, find them and and not get on the waiting list. Unfortunately, there's long waiting lists sometimes for them. So that's one area where we're trying to come in and and actually kind of speed up the the access to quality information. And um, you know that's what we're we we want to be known for as you know the the experts, but also very practical um, education and advice things that you need on on the day of or at that moment and um, and just really need that kind of support and and have you know access to the videos access to build out those routines that can be followed uh, that's that's what we're all about yeah it's supporting those real life tasks that happen every day that families have to walk through with their loved one and it's all those little things that can be frustrating if you don't know how to do that that add up to a big thing so alleviating some of that is great. Absolutely. Yeah. Any, any little bit helps if we just <laughs> help by 10%, you right. know, that's, that's enough to maybe uh, reduce uh, someone from just going into depression, just very, very small little cues and tips can actually add up to be a big difference. Yeah. It's so true. The other component is that engagement piece and you've put together a comprehensive team uh, while it's scientifically based and the educator side of things, you also really focused on the engagement side of things, which is is huge, um, especially as we're wanting to create that purpose and that meaningful experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're so fortunate that uh, so many people are really enthusiastic about what we're building and how to be really a one-stop shop for professional and family um, members that need need support in this in this space uh, one one person I do want to highlight is uh, Karen Potit uh, she's actually the creator of uh, the daily stim engagement uh, cognitive engagement platform she comes from really a, a whole bunch of uh, adult day, senior living. Uh, she's uh, also a, uh, a nurse as well. So she has a lot of really clinical hands-on experience working with with people and, and most specifically in 
um, the activity space. She's spent the last seven or eight years building out this 365 day program where, you know, every day you have different stretches and mindfulness techniques and these mental acuity games that are phenomenal for, um, you know, family caregivers, but also, as I mentioned, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, which can be with volunteers or, you know, family members that are visiting a community, uh, but which he really has uh, put together is, is now being expanded into not only the initial area, which is really that moderate uh, stage of dementia, we now have a, a mild cognitive impairment uh, program that's also kind of in this engagement space that focuses more on journaling and really ways to boost your memory and, and techniques to actually help you retain your memory as long as possible. Uh, we also have uh, ones that are really useful for children with intellectual developmental disabilities that help build some of those life skills and uh, some of those, you know, sensory uh, techniques and uh, and functional uh, skill building that, you know, behavioral uh, analysts and uh, uh, ABA specialists uh, typically use as well that we're now incorporating in the platform. So uh, we, we just have a great team across mm -hmm. the clinical side, across product uh, you know, the, the marketing side and, uh, and, and really customer success. So we're, we're really fortunate uh, to be really ready to, uh, to help more and more people here in the States. You have these offerings that make life easier for caregivers, personally, family, professionally. We'll talk more all about that. So you talked about that too, is our goal is to preserve the independence and dignity of the people that we love. And we do that by putting systems in place. Very few people or families can provide care without some sort of support, whatever that may be. And there's extensive research and science to support the value of those visual cues and maintaining habits. But First, can you speak to what's happening in the mind of persons that are living with dementia and memory loss? Yeah, well, having experienced it firsthand, uh, even not as a, a primary caregiver, just someone who's part of the, the support circle, there are changes that happen that you can't see. Very often those changes start even 20, 30 years before a formal diagnosis is given. So fortunately, there are a lot of modifiable risk factors that we can do now in our 30s, 40s, 50s, et cetera, to decrease the risk that we'll have for dementia. Uh, some of them are eating properly with uh, low inflammatory diets and decreasing your you know, processed carbs and, and added sugars. Mm -hmm. Sleeping. Sleep is the most uh, important thing that you can do at night uh, to really, you know, regenerate some of your your energy and you know spend a lot of that time in deep and REM sleep so that you can kind of regenerate those uh, neurosynapses uh, that you know need that time to really become healthy again. Also, exercise, working out three days a week at least uh, for 20 minutes at a, at a high intensity also have shown to be something that you can do to really decrease your uh, your risk factor and you know those endorphins and uh, that, that feeling of that natural high that you have mm -hmm. uh, really does um, actually have a lot of benefits for the brain and then uh, really staying socially connected with uh, with people uh, whether it be you know taking a walk the same day each day or uh, with with your your spouse or picking up the phone and, and calling your friend or staying connected with family members, those kind of four tenets of exercise, nutrition, sleep, and social engagement are the primary things that mm -hmm. people can do to push off Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. and related dementias. Mm -hmm. There's other areas like, you know, not smoking and, you know, drinking in moderation that, of course, uh, need to be done as well. But if you do some of those things, uh, there are different kinds of scientific publications that say you can potentially reduce your risk by between 40 and 60 percent of getting Alzheimer's disease. It's not a silver bullet. Yes, there are genetic predispositions, like the presence of certain types of uh, genes that will increase your risk factor, but um, those are, are definitely things that you can do. And I will add that in addition to those modifiable risk factors, there are different kinds of memory systems in the brain that uh, you can tap into 
to really help uh, with independence and help relearn or learn new tasks. And the best examples uh, I like to give are uh, the first memory system is your everyday memory. That is the part that unfortunately gets these plaques and tangles that really prevent you from being able to recall just basic pieces of information like who is the first president of the United States or what did I have for lunch yesterday? Or what is my, the show that I'm going to be watching tonight? Cause it's Tuesday at, at 8 PM. And I, you know, watch the show. Unfortunately, that conscious recollection of facts and information is what this, you know, really unfortunate disease robs us of those basic memories. However, there's another memory system. It's called your habit system. This is your non-conscious memory. This is what you do when you're not thinking about it, but your body or your, your habits or your lifestyle just kind of gravitate towards um, doing things because you've done them over and over and you can kind of tie a visual with, uh, with an activity. So an example of that is driving a car. So when you get in your car, you're not consciously thinking about the lefts or the rights or how hard you put your foot on the accelerator or the gas. You're probably thinking about, you know, for me, you know, what am I going to talk about during this podcast to really make it interesting and engaging for people or the, the workout today, it involves deadlifts and, uh, and overhead squats. Uh, those are not strengths for me. What am I going to do to kind of reduce my risk? And before you know it, you're home. Mm -hmm. So all of those lefts and rights and, and, you know, the accelerator break, that just happened because you're in that environment and you're doing it over and over, um, your body kind of goes on, uh, on autopilot. And that's exactly the part of the brain that we tap into through these step-by-step -step pictures, people will eventually start following them and doing them on their own because you're creating that, that non-conscious memory of repeating the same task over and over. And that's a lot of what we put in our, our scientific research publications and how we really got a lot of great uh, credibility with the National Institutes of Health. So uh, I know that's a, a long answer to your question, but I want to make sure I covered both the modifiable risk factors and the types of uh, memory systems. No, that's good information. And that's such a perfect example. We can all relate to being in our car, driving and realizing, oh, I don't really remember every detail of <laughs> how I got here. Um, yes. And it it's so true. There are things that we do that we just do because that's in our, our habit system. You just mentioned the National Institute of Health. Tell me more about the work that you are doing with the funding that they've provided. When Stu and I started Map Habit, we didn't realize quite the amount of emphasis the National Institutes of Health and most specifically the National Institute of Aging would put on developing innovative techniques uh, mm -hmm. to really help a really underserved you know, market that's becoming a more and more uh, serious problem. I think the latest stats are, you know, every day another 10,000 people become 65 or older. Third of all people, 85 and older, will get dementia. And the direct costs associated with dementia, which covers Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, uh, Lewy body, vascular, frontal temporal are, are the most common, are over $355 billion a year of direct costs. And that doesn't even consider the family caregivers who generally are unpaid. There's generally three family caregivers involved in the support circle for someone with dementia. And very often they will either have to decrease their hours at work or even leave the workforce completely, which one is not great for their own career advancement, but two, it actually puts companies at, at a risk for uh, lack of you know experience resources. So all these things combined with the growing population, uh, we just have been in the right place at the right time to get uh, funding and, and really have that very scientific focus of, of tapping this memory system that a lot of people hadn't known about. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate to win the Eureka Prize, which is a uh, dementia care coordination challenge the National Institute of Aging had in 2019. And that actually helped put us on, on the map and, and gave us that initial set of credibility that subsequently we've gotten uh, different phase one and phase two awards to build out our map habit system so that it's uh, really more engaging, uh, that there are different profiles for a, a, a 
family caregiver or a individual who's using it on their own versus a professional caregiver. As things change, we have a really great team and a content uh, library that helps with the, the education, the engagement, and gives you kind of sample maps for if you have an activity of daily living that you want to utilize. We have different levels of, uh, of support available for if you need a lot of cues and uh, uh, help with uh, a certain activity, we have maps of higher complexity. So uh, really the National Institute of Aging wants innovative technologies that fit unmet needs and, and large population bases that are easy to use and can be scaled up in the payer provider model and also direct to consumer. So um, that's that's just a little bit about the, the national, some of the grants that we've gotten. And you also won an award. Yeah. Yeah. So that one was went up against, I think, 40 or 50 other companies and they wanted to know, you know, how what you're planning to build uh, will be different from what's out there and why does it have that innovative component uh, scientifically. So the use of a habit system, the thoughts on gamification that we're really want to make this fun and not just a tool for a specific purpose and then you put it down, but really develop a, a social network behind that for uh, for caregivers to, to talk with each other along with our dementia educators uh, around different topics that are uh, relevant to them. And, uh, and also uh, the concept of using machine learning uh, to actually look at usage within the app and how that correlates with, with other people in a de-identified way. Uh, so no one kind of knows specifically who is, is being having some of that information recorded, but you can actually look at the age and, and the state in which someone is at and, and look at how long they're taking to do a specific activity like, you know, bathing, maybe when you first start out, a bath can take 45 minutes uh, or a shower, and it really should take more the baseline of 15 minutes. And is that trend going in the right direction where it's going from, you know, the, the 40 minute range down to 30 to the high 20s to, to 20? And, and that's then becoming consistent, not only for that person, but when a new caregiver comes in, is that range also being consistent? That's showing that the, the process is working. So machine learning can be really powerful in that uh, you can aggregate a lot of data mm -hmm. uh, on usability and, and really help with uh, with understanding efficacy and also if uh, um, if someone is cognitively starting to decline to, to really get ahead of that before, you know, something, you know, an avoidable risk factor like a fall or um, some sort of, you know, missing your medication uh, over and over. If we see that that's happening, we can notify uh, the right stakeholders to, to get in front of that. So I think that's the combination of those different aspects is what the National Institute of Aging really mm -hmm. likes. And, and we feel that that's uh, really solving a, a problem that should be solved. Yeah, you're addressing so many different things. And a lot of times, I think people associate that memory loss piece with dementia, but there's so many other components that are affected. The language, all of those different facets of the brain and understanding and educating people on that. What drew me to Map Habit was the uniqueness of there are different systems that offer those audio components, but it was the credibility of that neuroscience based and the visual cues paired with it that I felt is impactful for families, home care setting, uh, therapists, and you're able to then tie in all of those components together to be able to successfully care for people and uphold their dignity. So if we're going to get into, if you don't mind, um, more of yeah. that nitty gritty science behind the the habits and those visual cues that you've implemented. Can you share with us more about that? Yeah, so there's a, a lot of techniques that you can use visually. Uh, I think there's a phrase, uh, picture is worth a thousand mm -hmm. words. I take it a step further to say a video is worth a thousand pictures. Mm -hmm. So we have a ton of really engaging content from, from experts in the field, uh, whether that be dementia educators, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, 
Uh, we also provide MAP Habit for families with children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, so autism and Down syndrome. Uh, so that's a, a totally separate cohort. But um, but if you just think about how we learn and retain information and and really the nature of some of the, the caregivers, especially professional caregivers, you know, a lot of them are from different countries. Uh, they may not uh, you know, speak in the same dialect that the person with dementia who uh, that person is supporting um, can relate to. So it's, it's really powerful to when you have someone come in that may be new or they may not be new, but they're new to the person who may have, you know, a, a severe you know, diagnosis that you can communicate other than just with words. Mm -hmm. You can communicate with pictures. And very often when you see yourself doing something of basically in in your room or in your home and it's showing it's breaking down the steps you know it doesn't have to be a lot you can just have three or four steps like i i mentioned before it really can help convey information and you don't really need a you know a language system you can just either use the the tablet or, or your phone or a, a printout or alexa to, to basically say these are the the various steps to complete something and really anyone can come in and uh, and help someone get dressed because they're you don't have to speak that you can actually show them um, mm -hmm. and we're we're finding that uh, that works not only for someone who has a you know needs cognitive support but it also really works for for caregivers i mean we all learn better visually, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we even learn better by doing too. And that's a lot of the social science that we've built into our dementia education program uh, that we uh, utilize within home and community-based service providers or even, you know, families and, and senior living is that uh, when you actually have an instruction video on hand and eating support and you can show that video and you can show the positions and use that in conjunction with kind of your formal education and have access to those at the point of care in real time, mm -hmm. then you really can get much better outcomes uh, for a person that you're providing the support with or to, but also for if you think about the, you know, the respect and the appreciation for your, your, your team, your team members, mm -hmm. they want to have tools that will help them do their job better. And uh, you really show that um, by utilizing these, these picture-based tools that one, you can have better outcomes for individuals, residents, patients, what have you, but you also get better loyalty and uh, and you have improved uh, quality of life for the, the care staff and support uh, individuals, which really have the most direct impact on uh, the person who's impacted. If they feel supported and connected to the person that they're providing care for, everybody wins in that situation. There's that value in what they're doing. And I love that it's focusing on what that person can still do and what their abilities are rather than focusing on what what is that deficit or that loss it's shifting that perspective exactly and that's a lot of what we do when we get to know uh each person that we we work with we we have a we call an intake process but it's really a, a questionnaire that we look at you know what are the what did that person do in their in their professional or, or family life um, what are some of their goals that they have now? Because everyone, you know, has has goals on what they want. You know, what are their needs, their abilities, cues from the environment? What kind of connections mm -hmm. do they respond to? Are they a cat or a dog person? Um, what's the flow of the day? Are they, you know, generally better in the morning? And you can really kind of push the envelope on on what you do. But then, you know, once the sun goes down, maybe they, you know, really start having some trouble, and you want to maybe look to redirect or. Or, or utilize other other skill sets. So a lot of that, while it may be in some care plan, it's not always accessible at again the point of care at at the ready at the at the real time. And that's what we we really pride ourselves in is to spend that time up front, get to know the individual, and then you know build out some of these daily routines and build out kind of a, a highlight of that person's life as, as they're living it right now and have that as kind of a living, breathing document as as things change, you just basically pull up your mobile device and, and understand what kind of you know needs and abilities and, and, and cues work the best. And uh, we really have found that that's really a better way of uh, supporting people. So the professional caregiver has access and can utilize the platform. 
And does it also work for the individual that's saying, okay, I want to be in my home. I need a little bit extra support. My son or daughter doesn't live near me. Uh, what does that look like for them? Yeah, we do a lot of uh, clinical research, as I mentioned, and uh, a lot of it uh, has been happening over the past two years when, first of all, in senior living facilities or locations, they the doors were closed. I mean, family couldn't get in. Certainly service providers like us weren't able to come in, but yet we still were able to effectively utilize and get a lot of benefit out of, uh, of the MAP Habit system because um, we can remotely seed some of that information or like we're doing right now with a, a virtual interview. You're in I think, the Midwest, I'm in the Southeast, and we're still able to kind of make these nice connections. So that's a good part about map habit is while maybe someone who's living on their own, they may feel lonely or socially isolated. You can have other members of the family record videos and, and basically have them come up on, on the screen. You can have a family member that really knows the preferences and the right things to say, record their voice against a series of pictures that maybe someone in person are creating and really build that, that kind of personal connection and touch. It doesn't matter where they are in the world, uh, the, the, the platform is, is, is accessible. So uh, we've, we found that that's really where things are going. And unfortunately, if there's, or fortunately, if there's any silver lining in, in the pandemic, we know that uh, the adoption of mobile technologies and the openness for older adults to, to use it as a form of communication and to stay connected is, is on the rise. It's, it's only going to improve from here. So that's been really good for us. Uh, and we, we think that there's a lot of opportunity ahead. It's adaptable because you have it available by mobile, which is cell phone, uh, paper, printed paper for people that might not be utilizing uh, tech at the moment and smart devices. So Alexa, wherever that can be easily used for that caregiver, professional or personally, they're able to have access to that and have it be adaptable to what where their needs are. Yes, that whole concept is having multimodality. So there's mm -hmm. everyone learns in different ways. Some are auditory, some are visual, some learn by doing. We want to basically align to whoever we're working with, what, what is their preferred preference? Mm -hmm. We want to be able to accommodate them in, in the most optimal way. So um, there's a lot of thought and, and that's really a lot of what the, uh, um, the NIH funding has allowed us to experiment with all these different modalities, what aspects work the best and with what kind of people um, and in what kind of situation. So uh, we feel like we've, we've got a nice uh, step ahead uh, because we have spent that time up front uh, to, to really learn and build them out. There's a lot of different settings which it can be implemented. So not only I think in general people think assisted living, that's one. What are all of those different settings? Let's talk about the senior living mm -hmm. setting first. You know, mm -hmm. certainly from um, an independent and assisted, you often will work with occupational physical therapists where Maybe you have a stretching routine uh, because you you know need to work on your lower lower body strength or shoulder mobility. So to be able to record uh, different kinds of exercises, either of you doing it and having a therapist cue and prompt you on on a corrective way, so that when you're practicing on your own, you have that you know expert level guidance. Uh, even when the person isn't there, that's that's a great uh, use case and a benefit for providers to use it. Um, in the memory care setting, it's uh, it's it's really uh, very useful, um, as you can imagine. One for caregiver education. We know that the turnover is unfortunately very high uh, for any sort of professional caregiver, whether it be in, in adult living or with home or um, even with in case management uh, at, at a lot of the other you know hospitals, et cetera. So you want to be able to um, you know have those preferences stored and have access to some of our dementia educators to, to really do these wellness plans and assessments and, and really provide ongoing learning that meet some of the state objectives and actually exceed some of those standards for uh, for dementia education. So really the dementia education is probably the most popular area just because 
when you have someone new that um, you're, you're working with, you want to have a, you know, defined methodology of, of assessing where they're at and, mm -hmm. and get some of those, those learning and thinking maps uh, so that they can, you know, help out with PTSD or, um, you know, things like uh, even sexuality, mm -hmm. you know, what happens if you have two residents uh, who are, you know, intimately involved with each other? What do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, you don't always talk about those things, but we really have had a lot of that experience and, and know that those are things that we need to educate our, our care staff on. Mm -hmm. But also cognitive engagements, it's a huge one, especially for people who are at, at home uh, for the most part. Uh, they, you know, lack the activity directors and, and some of these, you know, really wonderful programs that are available in, in some of these more senior livings and, and PACE type uh, um, outpatient uh, facilities. Uh, but they, you know, they need some of those ideas to simplify the day and, and just give them a very dynamic uh, way of, uh, of of helping people increase their blood flow and, and mobility and, you know, focus on mindfulness. It's so important to get back to center and express greetings and inspiration, um, statements of thankfulness and gratitude. Whenever you go through that, even if it's just for a couple of minutes, your anxiety goes down and you just feel so much better. Um, and then when you complement that with uh, different kind of sensory and, and tactile um, different things that you can do to increase um, your hand and eye coordination and, and really kind of get you think cognitively, that's what's really useful in the home setting uh, for really simplifying, um, you know, maybe a home health aid or home care aid that's coming in and you really want um, a more dynamic experience or Let's say a family member is visiting someone in a memory care setting, and it may be a little bit awkward because they don't know what to talk about. You can utilize, uh, you know, Map Habit to go through some of those activities. Um, and the last example I'll give is volunteers. A lot of times we have volunteers come into either communities or, you know, uh, people want to meet different individuals. But again, sparking up that conversation with someone who might be older or different generation, you don't really know where to start. That's where it's, it's great to utilize our, our, uh, our daily STEM and our engagement platform. So those are some of the examples of, of how it's used today that I think would be you know, relevant to the audience. So meaningful when you can sit down with a loved one uh, or someone that you work with and be able to engage in something meaningful together and have that prompt, I think is so helpful. Just another level of alleviating a lot of the burden and stress that can happen for people, for caregivers. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, it's it's certainly not going to replace um, a caregiver. It's not going to replace an activity director uh, or someone working on enrichment. But there are times when I'm one on one, it it does make sense, and and you need to you don't have your tool chest to. Uh, um, to do all the things you would in a group setting. So just having these these tools uh, in place uh, is, is just really important. What would you say to people that say, like, I've got this, I've been doing this caregiving thing, uh, I don't really need any tech to support me? How would you encourage them to reach out for support? That Like, now is the time to do that. Yeah, great, great question. You really need to think about not just now, but what lies ahead. So while you maybe feel like you have your resources or in a comfortable spot, these kinds of uh, neurodegenerative diseases change all the time and without warning. And something new may come up where uh, your support network may not have the answers or you may not have encountered that experience before and it becomes a really urgent issue where you have access to all the latest scientific research and and really have a coach that you can uh, can reach out to and that that's really where we pride ourselves our digital platform is is one thing but the having the continuity of our team to be a sounding board and a resource is something that is is really invaluable uh, and there's there's just not a lot of other companies out there that that both have the the technology mm -hmm. platform to give you real time uh, access to information but then also you know the coaching at at the same time so uh, i would say that uh you're never comfortable. You're always looking for ways to provide better care to reduce your own stress and anxiety, and and really also to you know have your business stand apart from the rest. 
um, it's a very competitive uh, area out there, uh, landscape out there, and uh, you want to provide both, you know, new opportunities for, uh, for for your staff members to excel, but also have a reason for uh, for you know potential clients to uh, to come to you. So, really, the combination of our our focus on evidence based uh, research and uh, all of the you know wonderful content that's constantly evolving from industry experts. Uh, it's really a, a great resource for both professionals and, and family members trying to navigate this. Yeah, and we always talk about, uh, well, we, uh, myself, <laughs> for the podcast, <laughs> tell people that it we really can't wait for that crisis to happen. It's being prepared. It's being proactive, um, planning ahead. There's uh, so much a benefit that happens when we do that and we're not in that reactive state. You can make really good sound decisions when you've had the time to, to set yourself up for success. Where can we get in touch with you and learn more and look at implementing MAP habit as, as a part of either a senior living community or in a home? Yeah, so uh, I think the best way would first start following us on social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, that's a great way to get uh, different kinds of educational tips that we put out there and, and learn about the, uh, some of the new programs we have. Uh, certainly our website is a phenomenal resource at maphabit.com. Um, if you're a family member, you can click get a subscription and we will really have a 15 minute conversation with you and understand, you know, what are the opportunities and, and really, really customize something that would work for you. Um, but if you're a, a business, whether it be a home and community based service provider, home care, senior living, uh, a, a payer uh, integrated health system, um, go to our website again, uh, mapavit.com and click uh, schedule a demo. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to give you a full rundown of, uh, of, of what works after really understanding what some of your pain points are and what you're you know, looking to, uh, to improve over uh, what you're currently doing. Thank you. This has been informative and helpful. I think such a great support for people. So happy that you're here and could have a conversation with us and tell us all about it. Thanks so much for having me, Nicole. I've been a big fan for a while and uh, I appreciate your time. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. <laughs> In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode.